So Queen Cassis, PMI, was a career diplomat who served as the Thai ambassador for 37 years. Started in uh, the Soviet Union, then in Indonesia, Germany, Japan, and finishing in the United States. He um, joined the Foreign Ministry, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1968, having done, completed his high school studies, his O levels, in India at St. Joseph's College in Dar 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 um, he then went to the Georgetown School of Foreign Affairs, where he got his undergraduate degree, and then got his master's degree in social sciences at the Institute of Social Studies at the Hague. Then he came, joined, joined the Foreign Service here. <clears throat> Briefly, uh, in 2001, Kim Cassett was seconded from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to be an advisor attached to the Prime Minister's office during Thaksin's government. Between 2006 and 2008, he was frequently a guest speaker at the rallies of the People's Alliance for Democracy of the Yellow Shirts. He was foreign minister of Thailand under Prime Minister Adesat. Thank you. 2008 to 2011. He's a member of the Democratic Party and the Executive Director of Citizen Activation Academy under the Guam Foundation. He has recently launched the Academy to provide knowledge and a dialogue platform for civic and political education. I heard him say, introducing himself to someone recently, just a moment ago, um, that he is, he is promoting democracy. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, as well as the Freeland Organization on Anti-Trafficking of Human Beings and Endangered Species. He's also a member of the Asia Pacific Leadership Network for Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. His talk for you today is catered to the expatriate um, community and will provide an overview of Thailand's past, present, and future during this important turning point in history. The initiative of coming here when I met Emil was a consequence of the fact that uh, wherever I go inside Thailand, outside, I do get this one basic question, what the hell is going on in Thailand? <laughs> and uh, friends from abroad also do send emails and ask questions. And many of the journalists, you know, whether Washington Post and who I have known for a few years and so on, do also send written questions and so on. So I have decided that when I have, I, whenever I do have the opportunity, I will try to explain to friends there and far uh, about the situation in Thailand from my own personal experience, uh, both as a diplomat and second as an unintentional politician. It was not decided from the beginning that I would join the, the political life of Thailand, but it somehow came by by default because of the fact that uh, I did confront many of the abuses of power and corrupted practice by many of the politicians while serving in the in the government in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, when I met uh, Amy a few weeks back, I said, well, I would be more than happy just to come up to Chiang Mai and meet all of you here, the expat people, so that we can extend views. I can say a few things about Thai politics and so on as part of this civic and political education that I have just started to, to be involved uh, since uh, the middle of last year under the uh, Citizen Activation Academy. How it came about was of the re another result that uh, about two years ago, the military junta uh, did send invitation to six or seven political parties and for each party to appoint a representative to the National Reform Assembly of Thailand. So the leader of my party, Kun Apisik, sent me as a representative of the Democrat Party to this assembly. And I was a member for two full years. And uh, I, one of my responsibility was on the political reform of Thailand. I was the vice chair of the Committee on Political Reform of Thailand, and then we did make a comprehensive report on, on the political reform of Thailand. And then at the same time, I was also appointed as the chair 
of the subcommittee on the enhancement of democratic political culture. We also made a report. And for the past two years since the assembly was uh, I think, uh, uh, dissolved, all the reports about political reform, uh, political education reform, and so on, are still on the desk of uh, General Prayut, in spite of the fact that uh, there was a referendum on the constitution and so on. Then, so I decided that I must somehow continue this political education or the enhancement of democratic uh, political culture in my own capacity. So I had a conversation with the leader of my party, Kudapisei, that since we have uh, two foundations, one is the Seni Apaiwong Foundation, which does, uh, which does a lot of social work, and the other one is the Kuong Apaiwong Foundation, which has been doing uh, a lot of uh, education, but in a small scale, giving scholarships and so on. So I talked to Kudapisei, why not we turn the foundation into more of a political and civic foundation, I think in the line of a lot of the German foundations or stiftums of the various political parties in Germany. One which I think most of you would know the name is the Panrat Adenau Foundation and so on. So it was being set up along that line. But he said that instead of turning the whole foundation into a sort of a political and education foundation per se, he said, why not we set up this academy? So finally, they, uh, the foundation, the board, decided to set up this um, citizen activation academy and Kunavisit asked me to head this uh, academy. We have been operating for about eight, eight months and then we give most of the time uh, lectures and workshops, a few visits and so on, gratis free of charge. But some of the courses we, we, we we charge in order to earn some income for the academy. That's where I am at this point in time, trying to promote uh, liberal democracy in the Thai society as much as possible from a sort of a private sector uh, capacity. That's the first point. Second is that uh, the basic question that's been asked besides what's going, what the hell is going on in Thailand is why is it that Democracy has been failing in Thailand for the past 86 years since the end of the absolute monarchy on the 24th of June 1932. Why we have about two dozen military coup d'etats and about also two dozen uh, uh, constitutional law documents and so on. And uh, why is it that Thailand has not been able to graduate out of this predicament of military coup d'etat, street protest, then a new constitution, then a new election, then we go in a circle, coming back. And now we, I think, more or less come to a full circle. Five years of military government, and in the course of this month, we will have a parliamentary democracy again, but in a context of a constitution that stipulates that Thailand will be a sort of a semi democratic country, uh, guided uh, democracy and so on. And what, what is it, its manifestation? I think it's, uh, it's uh, because of the fact that the upper house, the Senate, is fully appointed by the military junta. I think the names will be announced in a few days' time. And inside this Senate, five serving military generals do sit in the Senate as senators, and one police general, the chief of the police. So we have six okay, serving generals sitting in the Senate. But it's not the only the number, the only the six personality, but behind them, it's almost a million military and police, uh, what you call the, the soldiers and the police, almost a million, at least half a million. So in that sense, the present constitution makes Thailand a sort of a, a mixture between a military government and a civilian government. And to change or to amend the present constitution, to get rid of the military away from politics, you would need about three-fourths of the 
votes inside the parliament, which would be very, very difficult. And then, or second, then, then we will have to have another street protest to, to do away with the constitution. Or third, we could petition His Majesty the King for him to, re, to make a judgment and reconsider whether which amendments could be amended, I mean, which amendments could be introduced in order to make the constitution more, more democratic. But we'll leave that uh, aside. Now, coming back to, to what I have in mind that I would like to say for 10, 15 minutes is, what are the democratic deficits of Thailand? And to demonstrate that, I think one point, just as of yesterday, there has been announced, I think, uh, worldwide about uh, democracy index for the Asia-Pacific region. And say the Asia-Pacific region has about, say, 28 countries. And the most democratic one is, uh, is New Zealand. And second is Australia. Okay, down the line. You know, number 28, I think, is Afghanistan. And close by is Vietnam, Laos, obviously communist country, North Korea, and so on, and China. But Thailand, number 20, 20, behind the Philippines, behind Indonesia, and even behind Singapore. And that's quite unbecoming for a Thai society that started to introduce parliamentary democracy since the year 1932. Why? Why is it so? I think I have three or four explanations. One is that uh, the, the coup d'etat that ended the absolute monarchy in 1932, the prime movers, the instigators, the initiators were mostly French and German military educated. So they went to the military schools in France, in Germany, when they came back. They were the main core group that stayed in the coup d'etat and entered the absolute monarchy. So my, my point is that the armored forces or the military establishment of Thailand had tested political power since 1932. And Inside the military academies, whether the Navy, the Army, or the Air Force, or even the police academy, somehow the political doctrine inside the military and the police establishments were that they are the Lord protectors of the security matters of the kingdom. To provide stability for the country is somehow mandated by heaven, you know, to them. So that test with the political power from 1932 has lingered on to this present day. And the notion that security and stability of the country is their divine right to be fully involved. And then that contradicts the very basic principle of civilian rules and democracy and so on, that the military, the armed, armed forces have to come under the civilian rule. And so we have been struggling with these two notions, one a full-fledged civilian government and the other one the military involvement in politics. So that's the first one. Second, to add to the intensification of military involvement in politics was the situation of the Cold War. And Thailand was a frontline state fighting the spread of communism the domino theory that gives the a sort of a automatic mandate to the military to be on the front line, of course with the support of the United States, CIA, and all that and so on. And then at the same time, there was the internal uh, communist movement, the, the Communist Party of Thailand. So for 50 years, you know, until the end of the Berlin Wall and the demise of the Soviet Union, the military establishment has been part and parcel from the political concept, or, uh, that's one point, but from the reality of life also that they have to be the, what you call the front line to fight communism inside Southeast Asia and inside uh, Thailand. So
so that's the first point that the the military establishment has some sort of a political doctrine that they have to be involved and be part and parcel of the whole political process in some kind of that's the first point. Second, second deficit of democracy has very much to do with the value system of Thailand. The patent client patronage system relationship. The respect for the seniority, whether in terms of age, in terms of rank and file position in the government, in the society, and so on, has been creating a sort of the personalized political relationship and the dependency mentality or reciprocity type of relationship that I respect you, you provide me with the protection and then with the goody goodies of the societies and so on, access to wealth, to position, to properties and so on. So so the this value system is in a sort of in contravention contravention to the rationality of the rule of law, to the accountability, to the transparency, to the governance principle and so on. That the rule of law is being put aside but this personal relationship hold much more importance in the affair of the state and also in everyday life. So Thailand is still struggling with the rule of law and the law of personal relationship. Okay, that would be my second point. The third point is that uh, since the second half of the 19th century, from a loosely centralized state of Ayutthaya period to the early Ratanakosin period. The reform by King Chulalongkorn, King Rama V, was about the full centralization of the Thai society, drawn upon the example and the experiences of the Dutch administration of Batavia, of Indonesia, the British administration of the whole of the Indian uh, subcontinent. And King Tulanongkorn at the age of 17 to 19 did visit the Dutch enclave and the British enclave in Java and in on the Indian uh, subcontinent mainland. And later, I think he visited all the European countries to hunt. So when he came back and finally his cousin and uncle and the two very powerful uh, Shogun family of Thailand, the Bunak family and the Pepasadin Amatayakun and so on. By that time when the King Rama uh, became, uh, I think, about middle age, but about 50, so then he was able to start to reform Thailand because all the powerful Shogun families of Thailand, they, they started to pass away, to die, and so on. So he was able to re introduce the reform, and the reform meant the full centralization of, of the whole Thai kingdom. Before that reform, the administrative structure of, of, of Thailand was uh, divided maybe into a sort of a three tiers. One is the Bangkok, the inner city, okay? The, the, the capital city. Second one is uh, in the Thai language, we call it Go Mueang Chan Nai, the inner city circle. So Ayutthaya, Hetburi, Ratburi, and all of this would be the, the inner circle. And then Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, Ubon Rajatani, even down in the deep south and so on, were the third cycle, uh, circle. Go Mueang Chan Nok. See? And then each of, the, each of the town or the principalities were ruled by their own uh, princely families and so on. But when Chula Rukon decided to reform Thailand administrative structure, the rule of the game or the name of the game was full centralization. And then King Chula Rukon started to send his own men, princes and the commoners and so on to come and rule, for example, Chiang Mai, no longer. So that led to the demise of the royal family of Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, Lampang, Lampun, all of this and so on. 
everything was being controlled from from Bangkok proper. So the centralization of Thailand started by King Rama the fifth last to this has lasted to this very day. In spite of the fact that uh, about 20 years ago under the Chuan government of the Democrat Party, Thailand did start a decentralization process. But it has not gone to the fullest extent like Japan or South Korea or Taiwan or even Indonesia in the sense that uh, the governor of each of the province would be elected by the people. At the moment in Thailand, only Bangkok, province of Bangkok, capital city, its governor is elected directly by the people. So there is discrimination at this point in time between the 5 million Bangkok people and the other 62 million Thai citizens in all the provinces. But Japan, with their 47 provinces of prefectures, since the end of the Second World War, each of the governor of the prefecture of Japan is fully elected. Indonesia 20 years ago, Taiwan 20 years ago, and so on. So Thailand at the moment, like in the province of Chiang Mai, it's like a, a snake with two heads, or an eagle with two heads. The governor comes from the Minister of Interior. He's a bureaucrat. But the provincial council chairman is elected by the people. And I think the division of labor is a bit uh, confusing to this very day. And successive governments of Thailand from the Chuan, first Chuan to the second Chuan to Apisit to Thaksin to Ying Lak and to this General Prayut, still, I mean, all of them have been reluctant to have the full democratization process of Thailand in the form of the full decentralization of all the provinces of Thailand. So, with this strong centralization, it somehow reduced the political participation of the, of the people. It denies full participation of the people in the affairs of, lo of local communities and so on. So the question of Thailand very much a very centralized country is a hindrance to the whole democratization process. My fourth point would have to do with all the political parties of Thailand. Maybe the De Democrat Party of Thailand is the only party so far for the past 60, 70 years that is not family owned. <coughs> it's not family owned. Or not a general, retired general owned. And today it's very evident. The Pur Thai is very much of the taxing. Family, Pum Chai Thai is the Sino, Sino Thai company and so on. And then uh, the General Prayut also has set up his own party, which I think has the majority and so on. So, more, maybe 95 97 percent of the Thai political parties are owned by personalities. Okay, one man show a family or a sort of a classmate of a military academy and so on, they set up uh, political parties. And then that is a major hindrance of the whole democratization processes of, 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 of Thailand. Okay, so let, let me repeat, uh, or to recapitulate, that why democracy has not been moving much forward. One is the military is political doctrine of their involvement. Okay. Second is the value system. Third is the centralization structure of the country, which is very difficult to undo or to unseat the, the bureaucrats, especially the Ministry of Interior. And fourth is the unsophistication of the political parties of, of Thailand. All of this combined has made democracy in Thailand, what the say in the Thai language or in the Chinese, you move forward one step and then you go back another two steps. It has been, you know, like a up and down like this for the past 86 years. Now my last point, then how do we get out of this? My first theory is that 
to do away with the custodianship of the military establishment of the welfare, the stability, stability of the state. That there must no longer be the notion or the instinctive feeling on the part of all the military establishment, the leaders and so on, that it is their duty to be involved in politics and also to take over the power in times of uh, difficulties, impasses inside the parliament, street protests and so on. The custodian of the kingdom of the sovereignty must be only in the position of the monarch of the kingdom. And let me cite one example that uh, I think six, seven, eight years ago, Italian democracy had many difficulties under Prime Minister Berlusconi. His personal life not quite moralistic. So much corruption and abuses of power. And I think the custodian of the goodness of the Italian society was vested in the personality of the president of Italy. So he decided to do away with parliamentary democracy for a while, have a technocrat government to clean up the messes inside Italy and return democracy later. But the Italian armored forces did not took the did not take the privilege into their own hands. It was being left to the highest authority in, in the country, namely the president of Italy. And I would like to draw that example back to Thailand. If it were to be the same case, then whenever there were to be some difficulties, the last resort must be vested in the very personality of the king or in the institution of the monarchy. And if the military establishment had no right to take the responsibility into their own hand. And His Majesty the King is the supreme commander of the armored forces. So the armored forces, whether they like politics or not and so on, they have to go to, to His Majesty the King. And I think, I think all of us here sitting here have been watching this Netflix uh, movie, The Crown, <laughs> Queen Elizabeth. And I think everything stopped at the position of the Queen in confidentiality between the Prime Minister and the Queen. And I think we have to set up that similar type of practices in the Kingdom that when there are difficulties that the bug must stop at the institution of the monarchy. And this, this situation did occur two times with uh, His Majesty King Kumipot Adudyadev, the last king. One when the students were being hounded by the military people on the street, Rajadamnern Avenue. They were pushed from Rajadamnern to in and around the, the Dusit Palace. And then the king opened the doors of the palace for the students to come in and have refuge. And then the king appointed an interim prime minister, Unisanya Thamasak, who was at that time the chief of the Supreme Court. And second, that when there were street protests between, uh, and then the military were, I think, started to kill the people on the street. Then His Majesty the King called uh, the leader of the army, General Sutina, and the leader of the street protest, uh, General Jamlong, to his palace. So what, what I'm trying to convey is that the buck stops at the very personality of the monarch. But I think the past 10 years, or even before that, His Majesty King Rama the Nine was bedridden. He was very ill. So he was not, I think, in the position to call the antagonist inside the parliament or outside the parliament to his parents. And he makes the final decision on how to solve the problems of the society. Yeah. And uh, that should have been, and from now on, I'm promoting this idea that the military establishment has no right to take matters into their own hands because above them, 
that is the king who is also the supreme commander. And if there were to be a process inside the parliament, the prime minister must seek an audience with his majesty the king. And I think both of them would have to decide and that decision would be the decision for the whole country. Mm -hmm. I think we have to we have to create that type of practice in order to solve the problem, to avoid military intervention in politics. And second, if the Prime Minister is unable to carry on running the country, he or she must go and see the king for the final decision. Then the third solution would be for ordinary people to put their names together and submit a petition to His Majesty the King for final decision. In the Thai language, we call it Yun Li Ka. Yun Li Ka is two, two days. And, and this type of uh, practice would recall back to the days of uh, King Kho Kut Ran Kam Han of the Sukhoi Thai period, where every Thai child was being taught that in those days, a thousand years ago about any citizen that has any problem can always go to the front door of the palace and ring the bell. What that signifies is the accessibility, the affinity, the closeness, and the king has to dispense with justice in times of needs. And I think the bell also signifies the freedom of expression, to express your grievances to, to the ruler. And the ruler has the duty to solve the problem. At the same time, the bell also signifies the power that the king can ring the bell in order to have the people assemble. Okay? That would be one. Now my additional point that how we could solve more problems into the future because of the fact of the advent of the modern telecommunication facilities. We could do more direct democracy. At the time of the so-called Thai period, not many people, so you can assemble and they can, they can vote yes or no. But now with the advent of the modern digital telecommunication technology, we could introduce more direct democracy. So everything doesn't have to be dependent on the indirect democracy by the representatives inside the parliament. And I think Switzerland, Liechtenstein, and Luxembourg have been introducing this more direct democracy back to the old days of the Italian states or to the three days and so on but using the modern technology so that any important issues, important projects, programs of the government, everything doesn't have to be decided only by the representatives inside the parliament, but it should be decided through the referendum of plebiscite through the electoral, elect, electrical means. And then once the people have been decided yes or no, then uh, the result would be sent to the representatives inside the parliament for them to carry out the budgeting or to draft the law or the rules and regulation and so on. So there are ways that we could overcome some of the difficulties of the past. The other one that I have been pushing for the past three or four years and now I'm quite responsible for it is to promote more of the civic and education. Education, you know, civic and political education. It's very strange that uh, in 1932, to this very day, we are the only country that attempted to be democratic through the writing and rewriting of constitutional law, believing that by having alphabets on a piece of paper, then we would become automatically a democratic society. But many countries, I think even in the United States, in Australia, New Zealand, and the newly, I think, democratic country, whether it's South Korea or even Japan for that matter, Taiwan and so on, every one of them 
every one of these countries have had some sort of civic and political education. I went to Taiwan two years ago to see the professor that who was responsible for starting of the civic and political education for the whole of Taiwan. And then they started with having the best teachers, the most brilliant teachers, a thousand of them, to be trained to become teacher of democracy. And after 20 years, one could say for certainty that Taiwan is now one of the most open democratic societies or countries on earth. But Thailand for the past 86 years have not, has not really attempted to give citizens the basic knowledge, understanding about democracy. So we have to do this in parallel to the amendments of the Constitution telling the military establishment that you should be in the barracks and at the border, but not not on the street of Thailand or even in the parliament or even in the government house. So I think the deficit of Thai democracy has to do with three or four points that I have mentioned. But we could overcome this. And then my point is that if Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on, you know, or even the Philippines have, have been able to advance democratic life, then why not Thailand? For us, it's not only to know what were the difficulties, the obstacles, but there are possibilities also of, I think, uh, enhancing the knowledge, the understanding, and the mindset of the Thai citizens for all of them to really become truly democratic uh, citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.